What's up, motocross action? I'm Josh Mosman, and welcome to This Week in MXA, episode number 11 now, presented by O'Neill Racing. This week, we're diving into the latest news from the Daytona Supercross and talking about what the MXA Wrecking Crew was up to last week. We got our first day of testing in on the 2021 Honda Sierra 450 Works Edition bike, and we had a big day of testing, so let's dive into it. We're coming to you from the garage, the headquarters of the Ecolu Suspension Co. Big shout out to Brian Medeiros, longtime MXA test rider for letting us use his garage to shoot this video. Diving into the first topic, we have to touch on the Cooper Webb versus Ken Roxon incident from the first turn at the Daytona Supercross in the 450 main event. Normally this type of pass wouldn't be as big of a deal, but there's a few different reasons that make this situation a little more interesting than most. First, it's Webb and Roxon, and these two have had a long history of battling hard against each other. And secondly, it's a battle for the 450 championship and at the halfway point now, it shows that things are getting heated up quickly. And thirdly, and probably the biggest reason why this pass was interesting and, and it kind of a talking point after the race, is the fact that Ken Roxon was so upset about it after the races were over. This season, Ken has been fairly calm, cool, and collected, but after the 450 main event, he was not happy. And even though he didn't finish on the 450 podium, he stuck around after the race for a TV interview to let everyone know that he's not happy about Cooper Webb. When asked about it in the post-race press conference, Cooper Webb said that Ken was running his mouth after they got back to the pits. And he said that Ken Roxon wasn't too pumped about it, but Cooper really wasn't sure why. It's just kind of a racing incident. Another aspect that played into the second corner situation was the distance from the inside of the turn to the outside of the turn was massive, a lot bigger than what we see on a typical typical supercross section where the track is a lot skinnier. Daytona Supercross creates a very unique track layout where the berms are much farther out from the inside of the corner, especially at that corner. We see guys like do this kind of stuff in Supercross all the time where they block a rider's line, take them to the top of the berm, and then keep going. But this time with the track being so much further out, it definitely extended it and made it seem a lot more aggressive. Either way, I like the excitement. I think the points are even closer now because of that pass. Cooper was obviously able to get around Aaron Plessinger in the last straightaway and gain even more points. So going into the race, Cooper Webb was six points behind Ken Roxon in the championship. Now with Cooper finishing second and Ken Roxon finishing fourth, points deficit has gone down to just two points separating the top two in the 450 Supercross standings. In other news, it was awesome to see Eli Tomac grab the win. It was his second win of the season. Eli Tomac said it in his post-race interview that if he got beat by Roxon and Webb at Daytona, it would have been hard to make up the lost points. He came into Daytona with a 31 point deficit, but with his win and Ken Roxon getting fourth place, he kept the gap down from 31 to 24 points in the championship. I'm pretty sure I'm in agreement with most of the motocross industry to see that it was great to see Aaron Plessinger finally get up on the 450 Supercross podium. Aaron has had a rough go over the last few years in the 450 class, but he proved that he still has incredible speed and skill as he actually passed the 2019 450 champion, Cooper Webb in the 450 main event to get himself up into second place and actually pull away from Cooper and hold him off for most of the race until finally in the last straightaway, Cooper was able to get him on a little bit of a surprise attack. Diving into the 250 class, it was a heartbreaker. The start of the night show with major red flags going on in the heat race for the 250 division and with two red flags in the 250 LCQ. Then when the gate dropped for the 250 main event, it was rookie Styles Robertson on his Rockstar has to run to grab the whole shot, hugged the inside of the second turn, which proved to be difficult throughout the night, got into the lead early. He led the first eight laps of the main event. So over halfway, Styles Robertson was leading. After landing on Jeremy Martin at his Supercross debut at the Orlando Supercross season opener for the 250 West Division. He ended up racing that main event without a front fender. His bike was all banged up, so it was a tough way to make your 250 debut. He definitely turned his luck around at the Daytona Supercross, got out front, and definitely impressed the crowd and impressed me for sure to see him out front on his Husqvarna 250. Styles Robertson definitely redeemed himself after a tough debut for Supercross at Orlando with his second place finish at the Daytona Supercross. Cameron McAdoo was fast at the 250 West season opener at Orlando 2, but it was really Justin Cooper who stole the show on a star racing Yamaha. This time, McAdoo was the man to beat at Daytona as Cooper was struggling with his starts. It's going to be interesting to see what happens next in the 250 West Division as we go to Arlington, Texas this weekend for our triple header. Justin Cooper has had a lot more experience winning races and scoring podiums, but Cameron McAdoo is looking solid this season and he's going to be coming into Arlington 
with a lot of confidence after his first ever 250 Supercross win. And finally, in the 250 class, we also have to congratulate Pierce Brown. He spent the whole season recovering from ACL surgery, and he's only been back on the bikes for a few weeks. For him to get third at what was his first race of the season was huge for the Torley Designs Gas Gas team. Pierce Brown skipped the Orlando Supercross because he wasn't quite ready to go racing after his ACL injury. And he spent that extra two weeks by not racing Orlando, getting ready, prepping for Daytona Supercross, and it obviously paid off for him as he finished off strong, passing his way through the pack to get third place and hold off Justin Cooper in the last lap of the 250 main. Transitioning from Supercross into what the MXA Wrecking Crew is up to, we just got the 2021 Honda CRF 450 Works Edition model, and we took it out to Glen Helen last week for our first day of testing. The Works Edition from Honda is inspired by the HRC factory bikes that Ken Roxon and Chase Sexton are racing on, and it actually comes with a lot more aftermarket parts on it that the KTM and Husky factory editions have. The Works Edition has a hand polished cylinder head inside of the engine, comes with a full titanium Yoshimura exhaust system, a Hinson clutch basket, and a lot more. Our big news from the first day of testing was issues with the ECU mapping. If you've read about the 2021 Sierra 450 in MXA, or if you know someone who's bought that bike, you've probably heard about the blubbery, kind of bogging mapping troubles it had on the bottom end. The good news is the Honda has a fix for it, and you can take your 2021 to the dealer to have them remap your bike for free. But the bad news is that the updated map didn't come on the works edition. We thought for sure it would, but the Works Edition mapping actually felt worse than the stock one, and Works Edition owners are going to have to do the same thing at the dealership to fix their bike. To make the story even more interesting, Honda forgot to update the ECU before giving us the Sierra 450. Obviously, it wasn't planned for Honda to give us a bike that still had the issue. They, they originally planned to fix it before we got the bike, but they made a mistake, didn't fix it, and I got to experience exactly what you would feel if you bought the bike off the showroom floor and took it straight to the track. Luckily they were there, they fixed the bike for us while we were at the track and I got to compare what it was like in the stock form right when you buy it off the showroom floor to what it's like after you have your dealer remap it for you. So we got the full video on the motocrossactionmag.com website or on our YouTube channel. You can check it out there and hear our experiences throughout the day of testing on that bike and really adjusting with the mapping and uh, playing with the issues that it had. Next up, I got to do an awesome interview with the king of Supercross, Jeremy McGrath last week over Zoom call. It was an honor for me to talk to him for a while and I got to ask him all the questions I wanted and he was super open and honest with each of his answers. In the interview, I got to ask Jeremy about his thoughts on the current Supercross season. I asked which rider he's been most impressed with since he retired and I was actually really surprised with his answer. I got to ask him about his favorite bike from back when he was racing and his favorite team, the favorite atmosphere that he was surrounded with when he was racing as well. I also got to talk to him about his original retirement when he signed with the Red Bull KTM team and he was struggling on the bike before he eventually got injured and ended up not racing it and retiring early. I also asked about his 1993 Honda CR252 stroke frame that he continued to use for the next three years. And I also got to ask him about how he transitioned from the factory Honda team to Suzuki. And he got to explain to me, he was super open and honest about the reason why he left Honda. And it was 100% to do with the aluminum frame that Honda was switching over to. He didn't want any part of it. He wanted to stick with the steel frame that he was using on the CR252 stroke. And that ultimately led to the big change. What did you like about it? compared to the aluminum. I like everything about it. I didn't like anything about the aluminum bike. I got <laughs> scars on my chin to, sh to prove it. Really? Yeah, that aluminum bike just bit me a lot of times quickly. Look, I know it was a learning period, but they didn't need to do that to me. I had won four championships in a row. They should have timed that a little bit better, you know? Uh, in a perfect world, how cool would it have been to have like seven, eight, seven championships at Honda? I mean, that would have been cool. They should have thought a little bit more about that. It was super cool for me. It was an, it was an honor for me to be able to, to speak with Jeremy McGrath and I uh, hope you guys will like that interview. And finishing things off for this week in MXA episode, Episode number 11, I gotta give a big shout out to Brian Medeiros. He's been an MXA test rider for over eight years now. He's also worked in the suspension industry as well. And now he's branched off, he's doing his own thing with Ecolu Suspension Co. So let's hear from him. What's up guys, Brian Medeiros here with Ecolu Suspension Co. I've been in the suspension business for about five years now and uh, just started this new journey with Ecolu Suspension Co. My goal is to provide customers with service that uh, make them feel like they're a factory rider. Uh, they can call me anytime, text me. I have a lot of knowledge with these, these newer bikes now. Testing with MXA, I'm able to ride all the new models before they even hit dealership floors and um, get a baseline for what they feel like and what it needs stock. That way, 
I have that information to provide to my customers and point them in the right direction on what to do with their, their new bike. All right, guys, that's it for this week in MXA, episode number 11, presented by O'Neill Racing. Thank you guys for tuning in. As always, check out motocrossactionmag.com for latest news, reviews, bike tests, results, and more. We're gonna have a lot of information coming up from the Arlington Supercross this Saturday. And if you have some more time, click the thumbnails now to see our first ride video on the 2021 Honda CRF 450 Works Edition that we just shot and to check out our Jeremy McGrath interview that we just posted as well.